McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop, Episode 10 Blood September 17th, 1921 Continued I stared down at the slip of paper from Noble James. He wanted me to meet him at 9 p.m. at the Iron Lion Bridge. I'm not very good at detecting lies and stratagems, so I sat with both my hands over my head, feet tucked together, heart racing, and I tried to figure it out. I felt like I was doing an arithmetic problem, only this time my life depended on the right answer. What was the point of this? This note, this arranged meeting? Did Noble James really want to speak to me privately? His note said he'd be alone. Would he really be alone? Or was this a trap? My reasons for trusting him were slim to none. He'd been kind to me, and I was head over heels infatuated with him. I had been head over heels infatuated with him. I wasn't any more. Let's not get carried away. Those are my only grounds for trusting him. He was a knight enthusiast. Like all other knight enthusiasts, his primary objective was to capture me. They were looking all over for me. And yet he'd seen me, and he'd deflected attention away from me. Why? Did he want to help me? Truly? Or was it a ruse? Were the other knight enthusiasts just playing along, so Noble James could win my trust? Perhaps they'd feared that a public abduction wasn't the best idea. Instead, they'd gotten Noble to slip me the note, and they planned to nab me tonight at 9pm, when the Iron Lion Bridge would be safe and cosy for their little crime. I don't know what to do. Should I show up? It's hard to be afraid of anything when you can teleport. I've been to Paris. I've proven that teleportation works, no matter how far you want to go. All I have to do is learn the name of some tiny pub in Ireland, and I'll be safe and away in a twinkling, if Noble James gets too close. Provided no one is looking at me. Oh dear. My biggest worry is this. I still don't know how a magic unusual's powers work. What if there's some kind of device or spell that lets magic unusuals track each other? If I get too close to Noble James, will he somehow know where I'm teleporting to next? It's a risk I don't want to take. But I'm also curious. What if Noble James really is a friend, an ally, and he wants to help me? I need help. I need things explained to me. I need friends. I'm going to shrivel up and die of loneliness in a month or two. What if meeting with him opens up new opportunities, new options? I'm willing to risk a lot, just for the chance to have things explained. Am I going to meet him? I think I've already decided. I think I'm going to do it. September 18th, 1921. Last night, I went to the Iron Lion Bridge to meet with Noble James. The night was chilly and wet. I had goosebumps, and they wouldn't go away. I teleported near the bridge, and then I found a convenient tree. I watched the bridge from a distance. I couldn't see Noble James, and it was 9.02 p.m. Was he hiding, waiting for me to show up? Or had he decided not to show up? Things began to feel more and more like a trap. I had an icy feeling all over, like something terrible was going to happen. But now that I'd come, I couldn't walk away. This was my chance for adventure and knowledge, and even if I landed in the belly of the beast, I had to take this risk. I stepped out from behind the tree, and I strode towards the Iron Lion Bridge. There was no one in sight. The lights shimmered on the water, and a cold wind picked up and ruffled the collar of my coat. It would serve me right if I stepped under the bridge and saw not Noble James, but the small woman, the head knight enthusiast. It's a trap, I thought. My heart began to beat hard. It's a trap. I reached the bridge and I stepped under it. It was dark down there, and I could barely see. I backed against the wall so no one could sneak up behind me. 
A peculiar smell was in the air, a nasty, wet smell that I knew I'd smelled before. I couldn't remember what it was, but it made me a little sick, and it made me uneasy. I inched sideways down the bridge. Hello, I called. Talk to me if you're here. I'm about to leave. You're making me nervous. Nothing. I got a gut sense. If Noble James was here, he would have spoken. I felt sure of it. The way sometimes you know you've just picked up a cold. Noble James wasn't here. He wasn't hiding in the shadows. I checked my watch. It was 9.06. Either he was being very tardy, or this was a trap or he decided not to come. Perhaps he'd been delayed. If he was meeting me behind the back of the night enthusiasts, he might have had some trouble getting away. I decided I should try to wait, for with every minute I spent under the bridge, I felt my hairs rise further and further in alarm. I was like a cat, about to jump up and disappear. The longer I waited, the stronger the smell grew. The scent was heavier to my left, and I took a few steps deeper under the bridge. I stooped. The ground was covered in something wet, something raw smelling. I removed my glove, and I dipped my finger into the puddle. I brought my finger to my nose. It was blood. Of course I knew the smell. I looked down, leaning so that light from a lamp post could hit the ground. The blood had pooled near my feet, and a trail was running off into the river. I felt like a ghost rose up and wailed inside my chest. This was real. This was significant. This wasn't the blood of some poor criminal left here by coincidence. This was Noble James's blood. I knew that. The Bible says that the life of the body is in the blood. I never quite understood that. Our life is in our blood? Did that just mean if you lost enough blood, you'd die? We all know that. Or was the meaning of that scripture deeper? Was some of our essence somehow entangled in our bloodstream? Was I somehow holding a bit of Noble James, touching a wet blur of his soul? I knew it was his blood. I could sense it. In a moment, I was sure, because as I rubbed the blood between my fingertips, the blood dried. It started to glow. This was the blood of a magic unusual. Apparently, our blood didn't glow when it was wet, but I could see the blood now on my fingertip, faint blue and iridescent. I stood up. Noble James had been wounded in this spot, then, presumably, teleported elsewhere. Someone had attacked him. That meant they knew he was here, they didn't like it, and they wanted to stop him. And they'd be coming for me in just a moment. I turned, wiping the last bit of Noble's blood onto my hanky. I backed up against the bricks, heart thumping, and I pictured McGillicuddian murders. I tried to teleport. I couldn't. You see what this means, don't you, diary? I was being watched. I looked down into the darkness of the bridge, so terrified my heart physically ached in my chest. I retreated out of the bridge slowly, my back against the wall, my hands grasping the bricks. I looked out into the night, where street lamps lit the side of the river. All I had to do was get around the corner of the bridge and I'd be out of sight of whoever was watching me. Then I could teleport. I could land safely at McGillicuddy and Murders and forget I ever took this stupid risk. For a moment, I was so frightened of the unknown, I felt as though I'd vomit. I thought I heard a scratching sound from underneath the bridge. Whoever it was, whatever it was, it was getting closer. I decided to make a run for it. I turned my back on whatever was under the bridge, and I ran. I shot towards the corner as fast as I could. I scrambled up the grassy slope, and then I made the mistake of looking back. I didn't teleport instantly, the way I should have. As I turned to look, someone seized 
my wrist. We hope you've enjoyed episode 10, Blood, of McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop is written and performed by Minerva Sweeney Wren, all rights reserved. Please subscribe, share it with your friends, and support Minerva Sweeney Wren at patreon.com slash Sweeney Wren. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop will continue next week with episode 11, Graveyard. <laughs>